Evening, ladies and gents. Uh, my name is Simon Brown, and I'm doing the first Power Hour of 2024. We're going to be looking at uh, ETFs. We're going to be looking at uh, tax-free, what to invest, what to buy. We're going to be looking at some big ETF accounts, eight, sorry, tax-free accounts, 800,000 plus ZAR. What have they got in them? Uh, and we'll go through the whole thing. We've got an hour here today. If you've got questions, drop them into the Q&A box. I'm going to come back to the questions at the end of the session. Uh, I've got a one-man show here today, so I don't have uh, enough hands to manage all of the proceeds. But uh, we off hello 2024, I suppose it is. And of course, today, 29 Feb, I hope we weren't working or we got paid extra for this extra day. I thought we would sneak the webcast in there. The big thing, of course, this year is going to be lots of elections and interest rate cuts. Those are what we're expecting. The elections, we know that they're happening. The interest rate cuts, consensus is they're happening. We just don't know when. It looks like probably mid-year we'll start seeing cuts both locally uh, and in the U.S. as we sort of move along. But the big news is perhaps we've got a new sponsor for the Power Hours this year. It's going to be sponsored by Standard Bank. We have confirmed that. We're quite chuffed. The December one with the JSC last year was the last from the JSC. I think we've been doing it with them for 13 odd years, all the way back from Maureen Glamini. We're going to kick off again in April. We're skipping March just because the public holidays and early Easter and travels and March just became all shades of messy. So we kick off in April. We'll do third Thursday of every month. There will be some exceptions to that. Again, public holidays, we might do a second Thursday, and then we'll end off in the first week of December. It will be in person at Baker Street, the Standard Bank head office here in Rosebank. You'll be able to attend in person, but we will still do a live webcast. And of course, you can catch the video afterwards on our YouTube channel or on the Just One Lab page. So super chuffed about that, and huge thanks to Standard Bank. The burning question everyone's got is budget last week. Was there any changes to the tax-free? No. No changes to limits, not the annual or the lifetime. And also Reg 28, no changes there either. Everything as it was. But let's start off and let's step back a first bit and understand shares and how those fit into indices and how those then fit into ETFs. So shares are businesses. They're companies that we know, and in many cases, we're using them. Discam, MTN, ShopRite, and Capitech are just four that are, are, are out there that we are using, in some cases, on a daily, hourly basis, perhaps, if it's your mobile provider. And they are listed on a stock market. They trade on an exchange. In this case, it's the JSC, the Johannesburg Stock Exchange. That enables the buying and selling of the shares. It gives us regulations over and above the Companies Act in terms of being listed, and it gives us standardization. So if someone says HEPs, we know what a HEPs is, headline earnings per share. It gives us that comfort in terms of the, the process of buying. There's always a chance you buy a poor share, also a chance you buy a great share, but certainly you've got that, that ability, you can go and do it. They pay dividends. Dividends are simply those companies make a profit. They keep some of the profit in the business to grow the business, to expand, to buy out competitors and the like, but some of it they give back to shareholders. That's you and I, and they do that as dividends. Either once a year, some of them do it twice a year, and some won't pay dividends if they're smaller companies and still very, very much on a growth focus. And anyone can buy them. You buy them via a stockbroker, an FSP, financial service provider. You buy them within a collective investment scheme, such as an ETF or unit trust. Anyone can buy, regardless of age, regardless of anything. You can invest into these individual shares. But... We take it a step further, you've got the shares at the base level. What we then step up to is what we call an index. So on the left there, we've got, for example, some gold shares, you know, Anglo Gold, Ashanti, and Goldfields, PGMs, Implats, and Anglo Platinum, Health, Life Healthcare, uh, and uh, uh, Netcare. We've got the retailers, ShopRite, Pick and Pays, uh, Clicks, Discare, Mr. Price, Truvers, and the like. Banks, Standard Bank, Capitech, First Rand, and all the rest. Insurances, Sunlum, Suntum, Discovery. And those are the individual shares. And what the JSC does is then put them into baskets of similar types. So we get a mining index, we get an industrial index, and a financial index. And that's just a basket of shares. So for example, you might have seen gold stocks are up in a day, but PGMs are down. And even within the gold space, some stocks are up 5%, some are up 1%. And they take that moves and they average them out on size. So the bigger you are, the more influence you have. And we then have 
an index. We have the Resi 10, the Indy 25, and the Fini 15. The number just refers to how many stocks, but they categorized by industries, by sectors. And already on that, we can now issue an ETF, an exchange traded fund. That would be the Satrix Resi ETF, the Satrix Indy, and the Satrix Fini. So you go and buy the Satrix Resi ETF. What Satrix has done, and they're one of the issuers in South Africa, they've gone and bought those 10 shares on the market. They've put them into a basket and they've sold you the basket. So if the average mining price is up today, your basket is higher. If it's down, it's lower. If they pay dividends on a quarterly basis, Satrix will take those dividends and pay them over to you. You could go and buy the 10 shares yourself. You've then got 10 sets of fees. Sometimes a, a stock exits the index or comes back in. You do it with Satrix. It's cheap, it's simple, and it does what it says on the sticker. But then we then take it a step further, and we then have a larger index, which in the South Africa's case is the top 40. So what that does is it says, we just take the top 40 biggest companies on the JSC. Regardless whether they're miners, industrials, or financials, we just want the biggest in, 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 in the market. And they put that into a basket and now we can go and buy a top 40 ETF. And whereas a moment ago I was showing you the Finney, the Indy and the, and the Resi, each of those only had one ETF on them. In terms of the top 40, there are about four of them from different issuers. There's also a, a top 50 from, from 10X. There's different ETFs in the space. They've all got the same 40 shares, unless it's 50, in which case they've got an extra 10. So it depends in terms of maybe they've slightly tweaked the methodology in some ways. Maybe they're charging a much lower fee than others because these ETFs will charge a fee, anything from 0.1% up to, I think our most expensive ETFs in South Africa are about 0.86 or maybe 0.88%. So well below 1% in terms of fees. Those fees are taken out of the dividend so they pay you the dividend less their management fee for that quarter. And they do as they say on the sticker. Here's a chart of our top 40 going back 20 years. You can see the rise and then the collapse in 2008, uh, the rise to 2014, a slow rise across to 2020, the pandemic collapse, the massive run off that pandemic collapse. And your ETF would basically be following that along the way. So if you'd bought it 20 years ago, you would have paid 10 Rand for the ETF. Now would it be trading at 67 Rand? So you've done incredibly well over the 20 years. More than just that, what you've also received in the time is those dividends. Probably on a top 40, you're getting about 3% a year in terms of dividends that are now being paid to yourself. So you've got the capital appreciation and along the way, you've also got the dividend payment. You should be warned, some ETFs don't pay dividends. They are very few and far between. The vast majority are paying. Those that don't pay dividends are simply reinvesting the money. They're not taking your cash and going and having a great Friday evening. They're just reinvesting it back into the ETF, and that then increases the value of that ETF going forward. So ETPs in 2023, and I'm particularly saying ETPs because those are exchange-traded products. We've got ETFs, exchange-traded fund. They trade on the JSC, basket of shares. We were just talking about that. We've also got ETNs, exchange-traded notes. Those, they don't hold the actual share. For example, the, the oil one or rhodium, or as the case may be. They might not physically hold the underlying asset. They will use derivatives and the like to get you that exposure to the price move. Technically, because it's a note, you have credit risk. If an ETF goes bust, it's in a separate vehicle. They can dissolve the, the operation and you'll get paid out the value of it. In the case of an ETN, if, they, if the issuer goes bust, well, you are now owed money and you join the queue. But it's, it's our big banks, it's Standard Bank, it's ABSA, it's FNB, it's UBS, banks which are not likely to go bust. We've got AMCs, Actively Managed Certificates, and we've got AM ETFs, Actively Managed ETFs. But let's first look at some of the, of, of the details. These are the returns for the last calendar year, and there were some phenomenal returns in 2023. Now, of course, 2022 was a, a bear market. If you were relatively new to the market, actually, if you joined any time since 2009, never really had a bear market before. But yeah, the one invest uh, tech ETF, 66% in a year. I, 
I've never seen an ETF do that before. Uh, you've got your Satrix NASDAQ. You've got the One Invest s and I mean, Even right down at the bottom, you're still doing 21.6%. Really strong returns driven by tech to a very large degree, uh, some gold floating through, but we've even got uh, India coming in quite strong. We had the Namibian uh, one coming through, Namibian bonds were coming through, uh, Signia Fourth Industrial Revolution, Japan, which has been continuing to run. Japan, of course, just making a new all-time high for the first time since December 1989. So a really good year to be holding on to ETFs. On the red side, well, that is all of the red that there was. 100 plus ETFs, that was the red. And what you're going to note with it is it was the PGMs, Rhodium, Palladium, uh, Palladium, the Resi 10, uh, the Sharia Fund, the Divi, but it's dominated by mining. It was a tough year to be a PGM miner last year. So a, a small list, but uh, I mean, some, some big losers on what was a re relatively small list in that regard. Um, Market capitalization of the sector as a whole at the end of last year. This comes from ETF SA, Mike Brown, Narina Fissa, um, $165 billion. It's a big number, but not relative to the unit trust industry. The unit trust is probably, I don't know, maybe as much as a, a trillion or two. Of course, you've got Reg 28 fund as well. It is growing, but it is small. You can see 2022, there was a dip. As I said, that was the bear market that we witnessed in 2022. Uh, number of products in issue, you can see the AMC's actively managed certificates coming through. They started in November 22. We saw a spate of listings last year. There were 66 at the end of last year. Our ETFs have remained constant-ish, 95. We lost a couple in 2023. If an ETF is closing down, you will get paid out. Or in the case, what happened here is some got merged because Satrix took over many of the ABSI ETFs. So they did some merging in terms of that. And we can see here the largest is Satrix managers, subsequent to them taking over ABSA, uh, 52 billion of assets, followed by Signia. Then ABSA, who's got the new gold, which is a biggie. Uh, 10X, which was core shares, but they got taken over by 10X. Uh, FMB, first round, UBS, one invest in Standard Bank. Prescient, which are the new kid on the block. And then Easy Equities, who bought the Cloud Atlas 2, and are going to rebrand those as being actively managed ETFs. So some chunky values coming through, as I said, then ties up to 165 million in total, of which 146 million of it is ETFs. The, the AMCs and the like are still relatively new, although they've attracted some 10 billion already, uh, 1.7 billion in the active ETF space. So what's an AMC? Actively managed certificate. It's an active listed fund. So in a sense, it's like a unit trust right, where you've got a manager who's buying and selling within the fund, but we buy it and sell it on the JSC. So it's nice and simple. They do because they certificates, they have an expiry date, typically a decade out. At the end of the decade, they'll either roll it into a new one, or they'll wrap it up and pay you out the fair value. It's trading on the JSC, which is why I really like them. I can buy them nice and simple in my normal account. And it can be offshore or local assets. We've got, for example, a small cap fund focusing on the JSC, AMC. But we've also got an offshore small cap fund focusing on offshore small caps trading on the JSC. Uh, private credit out of the US, which we can now buy. There's an, a, a, a resources one. Almost anything's possible in this regard. It can be equity. It can be commodities. It can be bonds. It can be anything within these funds. Some of these AMCs are putting ETFs and just managing the ETFs. They cannot go into a tax-free account, although I don't see any major reason why not. And I think in time that will be adjusted so that they can go into a tax-free account. And then an, ET an, an, act an AM ETF, which is an actively managed ETF. An ETF, we call it passive. What we mean by that is that it just, that top 40 index, it buys the shares in that index, it's got a basket, it sells it to you. Sometimes a share will exit because it's falling in value or it delists from the market and a new one comes in and they will rebalance that. An actively managed one is simply an active one. So we've got an income fund from 10x. What they're doing is they are actively managing that. So they're not using a rigid methodology as to what to buy. They're saying we're seeking yield. We're looking for a plus 10% yield. What do we buy to get that? Again, trades on the JSC can be offshore and or local assets, 
the moment, not into tax free, but that certainly will also be coming in time. Folks, I can see questions coming in. As I said, I'll grab them at the end. Uh, I've got uh, insufficient hands at this point in time. So tax-free, some details on the tax-free accounts. Introduced in the 2015 budget by then Finance Minister Nklanklan Nene, uh, initially it was a 30,000 annual limit and a 500,000 rand lifetime limit. I'm going to come back to those limits. March 2016, the annual limit was increased to 33,000. March 2020, annual limit was increased to 36,000. March 2024, which is tomorrow, is the start of the 10th year of the tax-free investment. The limits are very, very important. Do not exceed the limit. The annual limit of 30,000, well now 36, sorry. If you exceed that, SARS will penalize you at 40%. So do not exceed those annual limits. And at some point you will hit your 500,000 lifetime limit. Again, do not exceed that lifetime limit either. Most brokers will manage it. If you try to put 40,000 into your tax-free account, the broker's system would say, whoa, hang on, the limit is 36. But you might have multiple accounts and you might have put 36 into each and now SARS is going to be coming after you. Do not exceed the limits. So if you've maxed out every single year, since 2015, you've been able to put 303,000 Rand into your tax-free account, which is, truthfully, a chunk of money. And tomorrow, 1st of March 2024, you can add another 36,000, which will take it up to, what, 339,000 that you've been able to put into your account. So deposit so far, 303,000. Importantly, this runs tax year, March to February, not calendar year. So it resets tomorrow. And don't try and rush off this evening and deposit money. It won't happen. You know, when you move money around and it disappears into the night for a weekend or something, tomorrow, start fresh. New year, you've got a new 36,000 Rand that you can put into the account. I asked on Twitter how much people had put in so far. The majority, 40%, were under 100,000. Some folks start late. Some folks can't do the full 36,000. I was surprised that 19% almost you've done the full 303,000. That is quite chunky. That's a that's a, a big investment over over the last uh, uh, nine years. So I mean, kudos to folks who have managed to to max out their full contribution to the to the tax free accounts. I then asked, so how's your account doing? Uh, most of them were less in value, less than three hundred and fifty thousand. Now that could be someone who started with three hundred and three thousand and it's just done terrible performance. It could be someone who's only put a hundred thousand in uh, and done uh, spectacularly well. We got a couple of answers that said over a million, and a lot of folks on Twitter were like, "Yo, hang on a second, how's that possible?" Now I have seen a tax free account of a value of over a million. It was shown to me around December. They actively trade it. They are sometimes doing multiple transactions a week, never mind a month or a year. So they're actively trading it. What I typically do is I go and I buy and I largely forget about it. And we'll talk about that in a moment. But there are some folks out there who are absolutely are actively trading. And then Charles Savage, who's CEO of Purple Group, which of course is Easy Equities, he reached out to me with some data. Their most popular ETF in the tax-free accounts is the Satrix 40. That's the one I spoke about up front, which is the 40 largest shares on the JSC. Um, but here's their largest account, 885,000 Rand since inception. So you've put in 303 and you have almost tripled your money. I mean, that is, I, I, I hats off. I'm a trader at times. That is respect. Here's what they did on top left up there. They've got the One Invest uh, Infotech, which did 68% last year, the Signia 4th Industrial, and then the 10X S&P 500 current holdings. But you can see the main screen, which is that they've actually been fairly active in that process, at times holding the the, the Satrix uh, Indy, which has done very well. Uh, the Deutsche Bank, which goes way back, now owned by, by um, the Signia, Itrix, uh, the, the Satrix Emerging Markets. So they've been fairly active. I don't know who this person is, but I got to say kudos to them. They've done spectacularly well. And the best part is tripled their money, no tax to pay. I mean, that, that absolutely is the, the winner in, in that regard. So what can you put in a tax-free account? Collective investments, unit trusts and ETFs, and of course, cash. And then, of course, you can have from the cash, you can in the unit trust in the ETF space, you can have sort of interest-bearing type products, bonds and the like. 
Back in the day, you used to be able to put your RSA retail savings bond in. That's no longer an option. So broadly, it's going to be unit trusts and ETFs. I like the ETF space because they're transparent, they're low fee, and I can manage it with my stockbroker. As I said, almost every FSP out there, financial service provider or stockbroker will offer you a tax-free account. Make sure it meets your requirements. I'm going to come to that in a little more in a moment. So we'll park that there for now. What can't you buy? Individual stocks. Not a chance. You can't buy offshore listed. So you can't go buy the NASDAQ in, 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 in the US, the, the, the QQQ, the QQQM is the better, it's cheaper. You simply can't buy that. That's just not possible. But you can buy the Satrix NASDAQ in South Africa. And how that works, Satrix takes your rands, converts it into dollars, and buys you the NASDAQ 100. So you've got two levers generating return. One, what is the Satrix, what, what is the NASDAQ doing? If it's going up, so is your ETF. If it's going down, so is your ETF. But then also you've got currency. You've got rand dollar. So if the rand is 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 weakening, that's going to add to your return. And if it's strengthening, that'll take some of the 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 the, the return off the off the table. So, but they've got to be local. You can't go and put offshore assets into this. Uh, anything with performance fees cannot be included. Uh, commodity ETFs cannot be included. Uh, ETNs cannot be included at this point. AMC's and actively managed ETFs. This and that is because derivatives. So in the AMCs and the active ETFs, you can put derivatives in there and you're not allowed to have a derivative in a product that now goes into your tax-free account. So we just need Treasury to come up with a way to, I suppose, in a sense, police that, and then we'll be fine with that for now. But if you're looking at the ETF space, it's what, almost it's just over 90 ETFs. Unit trusts is probably close to 2,000 unit trusts, which is wild when you consider there's only about 300 shares on our JSC. Those limits, and I come back to them because they're so very, very important. 36,000 a year, 500,000 lifetime, do not exceed them. It is per individual. So if you've got a couple, you can do 36,000 each. If you're a couple with two kids, you can do 36,000 times four, which is 144,000 a year, and 12 grand a month. So it's per individual but do not exceed those limits. Those are hugely important and you need to stay within the limits. Please, please, please. Otherwise, SARS is going to charge you 40% and ain't no one wants to be giving SARS 40% that they simply don't need to. Important, growth inside your tax-free portfolio does not impact the limit. A lot of folks will say, well, I, I put my 36,000 in, but now it's grown to 40,000. No, no, it's only the deposit. So the 36,000 you deposit, there's your limit. It grows to 40,000, 45, 50, 60, 100,000. That's not the limit. The limit is just on the deposit that you have made. So don't worry about the growth within the portfolio. That's perfectly legit. Absolutely not a problem. It's what we're trying to achieve. And then, so we call it tax-free. What do you mean no tax? Well, no tax at all. So dividends, withholding tax. You pay 20% dividend withholding tax. You don't pay that. If you're earning interest, it's taxable beyond limits. I'll touch on that in more detail. You don't pay that. When you pass, it becomes part of your estate and there will, of course, be estate duty. It has to be liquidated. It will exit the tax-free environment. And importantly, then you pay estate duty. We can't claim back all the dividend tax that's paid in other countries. So, for example, uh, the global one, which is from 10x, they hold other equities and the like in that fund. It's 9,000 shares from around the world. Those companies pay dividends. They get dividend tax in the country of origin, and we get some tax relief with our, our double tax agreement with those countries, but there is some drag. It's small. I'll touch on that in a moment in more detail as well. Transfers. We've been able to transfer since the 1st of March 2018. The question is, why would you want to transfer your tax-free account? Simply because maybe you're in one that it just doesn't work for you. I, I see a lot of people who've been put into savings products. In other words, basically, it's a bank savings account. And if you're, you know, 104 years old, that might be the right product for you. But if you're 24 or 44 or 64, heck, even 84, there's every chance that that's the wrong product for you. So now you need to transfer. Some just might have fees that you look at and you think, yo, those fees are expensive. 
Most tax-free accounts are free. There's no charge on them. There's a brokerage fee, but there's no charge on it. If you want to transfer, don't just sort of take everything out and stick it into a new one. You've got to actually do a transfer. So you open up your new tax-free account. You contact whoever it is. You do the FICA, all of that. You've got your new tax-free account ready. You now go back to your, your current tax-free account and you say, I want to do a transfer from this one to that one. You fill out a whole lot of forms on both sides and the process will happen. In many cases, you're going to have to turn whatever's in that account into cash, move across the cash, and then reinvest, which means you've got transaction fees, but no tax implication. And if you're depositing in, you have to put cash in. You can't, if you've got some ETFs that you say, well, I've got 36,000 of ETFs, I want to put that in my tax free. You can't. Only cash can go in. So what you've got to do is sell that 36,000 of ETFs, move the cash in, and then buy it again on the other side. Transferring, it's paperwork, but a lot of people have done it. Sometimes you get uh, 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 misconstrued and SARS doesn't understand. You know, they, they, they bust you and they say, oh, what's happened here? You've moved money in. It's been a transfer. Get the documentation. Make sure you fill in all the right forms and send the right forms to the right people. Tax-free withdrawals. You can take money out whenever you want. You can absolutely take your money out and go and have a great weekend or a retirement or a new car, whatever the case is. But this really is designed for long-term investing. And in an ideal world, your tax-free money should be the last money that you spend because the longer you leave it in there, the longer you get that benefit because the more it grows and the less CGT, well, you don't pay any CGT. So the more it grows, the more you save on capital gains tax, which is maximum of 18%. The longer you're not paying any dividend withholding tax, which is 20%. Importantly, selling, buying, trading within a tax-free account is not a withdrawal. So you put your 36,000 in, it grew up to 40,000, and now you wanted to change what you own. So you sell those 40,000 of ETFs and you buy another ETF. That's transactions. It's not a withdrawal. As long as the money stays within the tax-free account. And importantly, it has to be a tax-free account nominated by the provider. You just can't turn around to SARS and say, uh, <clears throat> that's my tax-free account. No, no. You've got to go and open a nominated tax-free account. Uh, the thing with, withdrawing, with withdrawals is it reduces your lifetime limit. So your lifetime limit is 500,000. You put 36,000 in, your lifetime limit has now dropped to 464,000 rand. That's now your new limit because you've used 36,000 of it. If you take that 36,000 rand out, your limit remains, lifetime limit remains 464,000 because you'd already used some of that deposit. So when you take money out, it doesn't reset your annual limit, it doesn't reset your lifetime limit. So don't be taking money out unless you absolutely have to. If things go horribly wrong, you can, as I said, it's easy enough, turn it into cash, do a withdrawal, it's nice and simple. But you really want to be using this for the last money that you spend, so it's got the maximum amount of time to grow, to compound, and to get that tax benefit. So some numbers, because heck, I'm a number nerd, so let's go look at some numbers. Child was born tomorrow, and you put 36,000 rand at birth in a tax-free account for them, and you leave it for 65 years. It is then worth just under 3 million rand, and this is in today's money. I've assumed a 7% compound return. In other words, and I'm calling it a real return. What I mean by that is that actually your return was 12%, but inflation was 5%. So your real return, your after inflation return is 7%. Your portfolio would actually be bigger in size, but I'm going to tell you then it's worth 58 billion Rand and that's a meaningless number. In today's money, 65 years time, it would be worth almost 3 million. And if you do the 4% rule, which says you draw 4% a year out of that portfolio, which technically means that it'll outlive you, you're going to get almost 120,000 Rand every year, no tax payable until this person dies, and then it goes into the estate. And I know what you're thinking, 120,000, that's not bad. It's 10 grand a month, not bad. It's not retirement. But let's be clear, all you did was once, at birth, put 36,000 in. You didn't save another cent. Imagine if we did it differently. You max out. So the child is born tomorrow, and you put 36,000 in their tax-free account, and you max it out until you get to that 500,000 limit. 
Now, what have you got at 65 years? You've got 27 million rand in today's money. 4% rule means you're getting a million rand a year tax free. That is now 90,000 rand a month. No, and no tax liability. Now we are talking. Now we have got a retirement. And, and think about how this fundamentally changes a person's life. One of the, you know, what are our big expenses every month? Well, tax, medical aid, home loan, car, and retirement saving. Suddenly you don't have to worry about retirement saving. Suddenly you've got free cash. Suddenly you can start, you know, worrying about your, your parents, your, your children if you've got. I mean, the, 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 the mind shift it does. Now, 65 years. Yeah, I, I, am I going to live to be 65? I would be old. I would be very old. Although I'm 10 years in, so I've only got another 55 years to go until I, I would be 110 almost. I mean, that's proper old. Um, but the point is, many of you are saying, yeah, I ain't got the 65 years. Fair enough. And then the question is, well, why don't I go do one for 20 years or 30? Well, because there's hundreds of different numbers I could have done. Could have done one for every duration. But you get the point. You've got two powerful forces at play here. One, time. Two, no tax. And that is massive. That is absolutely massive. If you were paying tax on this, along the way, you would have been paying dividend tax, which means that your 27.2 million would be smaller because of dividend tax. Every time you bought or sold, every time you sold, you would then get paying some CGT tax, which would again reduce that number. And then when you took out your million a year, you would be subject to capital gains tax again, which would then hit you up to 18%. Let's call it 15%. So now instead of 1.0818 million, you're now getting 950,000. Look, you're not poor by any stretch of imagination, but if you can have an extra 150K in your pocket or SARS's pocket, I know which pocket you wanted it. Uh, for preponderance of avoidance of doubt, your pocket, not SARS. So that's the key thing. It's that time, which is huge, and it's also the tax free. Now, there's a small caveat here. You can open a tax-free account for a kid who's one day old, not a problem. Absolutely not a problem. But here's the thing. They turn 18. This is now their tax-free account, and they can do whatever they want with it. Now, I don't know about you, but I remember being 18, and I was many things. Responsible was not one of them. But let's be clear. You've also got 18 years to make this kid responsible. Or perhaps you could hide it from them. I don't know. I, that, that's you and your family. I'm not going to get involved in that. But this is the superpower of that time and that tax free. And yeah, as I said, 7% real return. Maybe it's only going to be six. Maybe it's going to be eight. I don't know what it's going to be, but that is an after inflation return. So that the numbers are in today's spending power. And that is a lot of spending power for someone who hasn't done anything in terms of their adult life, in terms of saving for retirement. So then the question is what to buy. Okay, so we ask our faves. If you head over to justoneup.com slash fave ETFs, we have asked our faves as to what they are putting into their tax-free accounts. David Shapiro, uh, a whole bunch of, we've got Rochelle there. We've got uh, Sol Ferry, she's better known on the socials. Um, bunches of folks, we ask them, what have you got in your tax-free account? And I tell you what, we've seen some excellent answers coming through from people and stuff that we've really, I, I've learned a ton. I mean, ETFs, I'd, Never, never, ever, ever heard of. We also ask them what their other free uh, favorite ETFs are, not just in their tax-free account. So we get some offshore ETFs and the like. But go have a look at those. Uh, mine are there too. I think I hold far too many. I We have a theory. When I say we, rural we, Christia von Heerden and myself, she, okay, my power just went, generator will be back. Everything runs except that light. So suddenly I look dark. Don't worry about it. Christia used to run SA Warren, SA Warrens just, just one lap up until three years ago. Uh, we One ETF to rule them all. Because the point around, and let's be clear, that example I showed you earlier from Charles Savage, that person has been actively managing their ETF. So ETFs are passive, but they've been active in buying and selling, and they've done very well. But there's somebody else out there who's been active and bought exactly the wrong thing at the wrong time and done very, very poorly. So what about just one global ETF that encompasses it all? And there are a couple of them on the market, but there's bunches of them. There's the F&B one. Uh, it's about 1,200 stocks. It includes some emerging markets, no Africa. That used to be our favorite. And then along came the new one, which was Core Shares, now 10X. And that's called Global. And those are the codes you will find on the JSC. And that is 9,000 stocks. It is literally the world. 
There's GlowDiv also from now 10x, and that is mature global. So that will be the Procter and Gambles and the Johnson and Johnsons. Uh, you know, their, their, their methodology is in the US, you've got to have 25 years of consistent dividend payment. So there's no Apple because they weren't paying a dividend 25 years ago. There's no NVIDIA, there's no Meta, none of those because they weren't paying dividends 25 years ago. Some e e uh, emerging market, no Africa. Uh, then there's the Satrix World, which is global developed markets only. There's the Signia 500, which is US large caps, the 500 biggest stocks in America. And any one of those, I mean, even if you're buying the S&P 500, it's American, but think about Apple. I mean, I'm sitting here, I'm looking at a Mac, I've got an iPhone, you know, they're Apple, but they sell their products the world over. So it's not as if they are only American. Yes, America makes up the majority of all of these ETFs, but those American companies are the Coca-Colas, the IBMs, NVIDIA, for example, is in them, but they're selling their, their Grace Hopper 200 chip to, to anyone. Well, subject to stock availability. Let's be clear about that. Um, just one lap.com slash ETFs. We do regular reviews of ETFs. You'll find details on the different ones there, local and offshore as well. We also had a brilliant presentation from Narina Fisser. Uh, this presentation is now three and a half years old, but well worth. If you head to just one lap.com slash power hour, scroll down, you're going to find it. Or we'll just go and have a search on, on the website for Narina Fisser, and you will find she's done a couple this one is absolutely top-notch. Narina always knocks it out the park, but sometimes she knocks it out the park twice in one presentation, and this was such as an example. So what about putting cash? I, I was dismissive of cash earlier. So firstly, why cash? So you earn interest. So whether it be cash or bonds, you're earning interest on it. And that interest is added to your income and taxed. If you're under 65, your first 23,800 a year of interest is tax-free. If you're over 65, it's 34,500. This number hasn't changed since 2015, which coincidentally was when the tax-free accounts came in. So Treasury is patently saying, we're not going to increase your interest exemption. Use your tax-free account. Now, I've got issues with that. Firstly, if you suddenly, if you've got half a million rand that you want to earn interest on. You can't put half a million rand into a tax-free account because you're limited to 36,000 a year. Now, there has been talk, I have no idea where it's going in Treasury, that why don't we say if you're over 65, then the annual limit falls away and there's just a lifetime limit. I don't know. We'll see where that goes. At the moment, that is it. So, your first 23,800, or if you're over 65, your first 34,500 of interest, whether it be from bonds, uh, from, from REITs, which is a real estate investment trust, because they also pay income, or whether it just be from money in the bank. And let's be clear, we're earning chunky yields right now. Your first amount should just be normal because you don't pay tax on it. Remember, if you're married, it's for each of you. So if I've got an interest problem and my partner hasn't, well, I can move some of that cash to her and offset that interest to her exemption. If you're looking for income and you're the 104-year-old person in the audience today and you're saying, but I need the income and you're maxing out on your 34,500, then absolutely you can do cash or near cash products. But if you are a young in other words, 84 and under, then really the cash products they don't give us enough growth. Yes, we're getting currently, and the phrase out there, and I've used it, and many people I've interviewed have used it, the phrase is, we're getting equity-like return with bond-like risk. And that is a true statement. But that's not going to remain like that. Interest rates will start coming down. Those equity-like returns from bonds are going to start reducing down. Typically, equity will give you better returns. Hence, if you've got time on your side, if you're, if you're measuring retirement in, in, in a decade or more, you don't want cash in your, in your, in your tax free. You don't, I mean, you want some cash. You want an emergency fund. You maybe even want some bonds. I mean, I, I, you know, during the pandemic, the retail bonds, SA retail bonds, I think got to 11.5%. So my wife and I picked up some. And then two years ago, it was back at 11.5% and we reset. I just couldn't, you know, it's like, yo, that's just a crazy return but it's a small slice of our overall investment portfolio. Property stocks, REITs as they are called, uh, distributions are taxed as income. So they're an efficient place to put tax-free accounts. There are three local and three offshore. I don't know why I didn't list the offshore ones there. They're offshore properties, but they're on the JSC. 
Um, so there's one from Signia, one from uh, One Invest, and one from uh, uh, 10X, which was core shares, same issuers. So you can go and buy property, and then that yield that you get, now I've just done some reviews on it. So just one app.com slash ETFs. The last two weeks, I've looked at the different property stocks, local and offshore. The local ones, your yields are, if my memory is correct, around 7%. Um, and then, of course, you might get some capital appreciation. I'm not going to run to the, is property good value? Uh, go and read the local one. There's an interview there I did with Daniel King from uh, Merchant West Investments around property. He's not so convinced about the great value of it. But I like having some property in there because I don't pay any tax on, on the, the distributions, which are taxed as income. Offshore, as I said, there's a drag on dividends. Some of it is claimed back. I reckon it's half a percent or less per year. That is the drag. So instead of doing a 20% return, you're going to do a 19.5% return. And truthfully, I think it's closer to 0.2% drag. So instead of 20, you're doing 19.8%. And that's IRS saying, sorry, tax-free, South Africa, don't know, don't care, not interested. So they charge 30% dividend tax. We can claim 15 back. That happens. The issuer does it. They claim back that 15. So we end up paying a 15% dividend-only tax to the US government, which we get nothing, but it's tiny. It's 15% of a dividend. A dividend is about 2%. That works out at 0.3. It's not significant at all. But we can get that offshore exposure. Japan, India, uh, offshore bonds, tech, S&P 500, uh, emerging markets, China, all of those are available as ETFs on the JSC that can go into your tax-free account. And you get the two moves. One are those index, the shares, and the second is the currency. And the currency weakens, you get the uplift there as well. So we can get offshore exposure. Those of you who are thinking, yeah, but I don't want to own any South African stocks. Well, then take your, 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 your tax-free account and just buy ETFs that get you offshore exposure. It's not part of your uh, million rand a year or 11 million with SARS approval. So nice, simple, easy. Tactical. So I use my tax fee for tactical. And, and what I mean by that is I have a core holding of boring, diverse ETFs. And then I look out across the universe and I say to myself, Japan looks interesting. So I take a position in Japan. I did it. But as an example, uh, you know, tech looks interesting. Take a position in tech. And then at some point, I say to myself, well, tech is no longer exciting or Japan is no longer exciting. So I exit that. So I a lot of folks are using their tax-free accounts for their tactical position because, you know, I've got ETFs that I literally bought in December 2000. Yep, 23 and a half years ago, Satrix 40 listed, and I went and bought some of those Satrix 40s. I still hold them to this day. Paid six bucks, now they're worth 67 bucks, and of course I've had dividends the whole way over as well. So that's my call. And one day I'll sell them and I'll get a giant CGT bill on it. But in the meantime, I want to do some trading, but I don't want to pay the tax. So you do it in your tax-free account. The problem is there's three decisions. What to buy, or what, and then you've got to buy it, get that timing right, and then you've got to sell it and get that timing right. It's not as easy as it looks in the sticker. When I say Japan, it's hindsight. Let's be perfectly clear. I wasn't saying Japan a year ago. Monthly versus lump sum. So you've got 36000 a year that you can do. That's the maximum. You don't have to do it. You can do less. The question I get asked is, should I tomorrow, 1st of March, put my 36000 Rand in, or should I do 3000 Rand a month for 12 months? The math is simple. Lump sum is better because markets tend to go higher. They seldom go down over protracted periods. We did see that in 2022, first bear market in the US in over a decade. Math says lump sum is better, but maybe you can't, maybe that stresses you. Well, then do monthly. Maybe you don't have 36,000 and you can only do 3,000 a month. Well, then do 3,000 a month. Maybe you don't even have 3,000 a month. And you're like, you know what? I can do 1,150 rand a month. And in December, I get a bonus. And Lexi, maybe I can take some bonus money and stick that in. That's fine. Do what you can. You know, don't look at the 36 and say, I can't do the 36, so I'll do nothing. Look at the 36 and say, I can't do it, but I can do this. And then do that amount and grow it. And it just means it's going to take you longer to get to your, to your, to your lifetime limit. If you're maxing out, it's about 15 years. If you're not maxing out, maybe it's 20, maybe it's 30. It doesn't matter. 
Just be investing. That's what matters. The, the sums, uh, the amounts aren't important. And I know you're saying, of course, they are. I know. But, you know, you've got personal circumstances. If you can't afford 36 a year, you simply can't afford 36 a year. That's just how it is. Do what you can afford. Trading in your tax free. I get asked this all the time. So it's got its own slide. Yes, you can. You can buy and sell as often as you want. It's not a withdrawal. It's not a problem. Trade to your heart's content. We saw that earlier slide, 883,000. As I said, I saw a million rand tax free account last year. And in fact, this chap's been showing it to me over the years. He trades very actively. So then some of the best ETFs. You're looking for a tech ETF? This is the best one. Um, and, and I mean, if you go to just one lap, I'll give you more details around the whys. I'm saying that, et cetera. Uh, this one, because, so we've got a NASDAQ one, but the NASDAQ isn't pure tech. It's the 100 biggest companies on the NASDAQ, excluding financials. Okay, but that's just, so it's got no banks, but it's got other stuff in there that isn't tech. This tech ETF from One Invest, it takes the S&P 500, takes the tech stocks, puts them in an ETF. So what you've got is pure tech. Weirdly, no Amazon, because they're a consumer stock, not a tech stock. But there you've got your NVIDIAs, your Microsofts, your Apples, your Broadcoms, Adobes, et cetera, et cetera. You'll never get Tesla in there because it's not a tech stock, it's a car stock. And I know we can debate that and Viv Governor will tell you it's a tech stock. Point is, it's not by the classification. Pure tech. And this was the one that last year did 63%. Remember, past performance, no guarantee, future performance. Code etf 5 IT, total expense ratio, 0.35%. Best global ETF, this is my preferred. I showed you a bunch of them earlier. He has your top 10 constituents. So your top is dominated by tech. But then you've got, I mean, there's United Health, there's Berkshire, there's a little bit of Tesla. This is 9,000 stocks from the world over. 61% of it is the US. We've got Japan at six, the UK, don't like that. China, don't like that, but that's fine. Heck, we got some France and everything. Uh, TUR is 0.28%. It includes emerging markets, and it actually has more emerging market exposure than the other global funds, which I quite like as well. And we don't need South Africa exposure. We've got that, right? We've got a retirement fund already. We've got this, we've got a property here. We've got plenty of home exposure. Best emerging market from Signia, SYG, EMF, TUR, 0.41%. This includes China. Uh, you see the Taiwan Semiconductor Manufacturing. Uh, they make all the chips. You've got Samsung. You've also got Tencent, which, of course, is uh, in many of our portfolios by a process in NASPAS. Alibaba, and IC, ICI Bank, which is the biggest bank in the world, uh, China Construction Bank. Emerging markets only. So you can start to see where you could get tech, tech, uh, tactical. You've got your global, and then you bullish tech, and then you go bullish EMs. And anyway, you can have loads of fun here. Best SA Inc. In other words, South African businesses, not the top 40, because that top 40 is Richmond, BHP, and all these other global players. The FNB MID. This is the mid cap ETF. Tura is 0.59. And these are, these are South African companies. Yes. Discovery has a little bit of offshore. Yes, so does Sabania, so does Harmony. But these are companies that are going to be predominantly making their profits in South Africa. The top 40, those 40 biggest companies, about 70% of profits come from beyond the borders of South Africa. It's the Richmond, it's the BHP groups, uh, the, the Anheuser-Busch, British American Tobacco. Most of the profits are coming offshore. This ETF, most of the profits are in South Africa. Best bond ETF? There are so many. There are just so many currently throwing out 10%. Remember that you're buying in the secondary market, so your capital is not guaranteed. RSA retail saving bonds, your capital is guaranteed, but it can't go in a tax free. Those rates are accurate as we speak right now, but of course, tomorrow, 1st of March, the rates will reset. Those inflation linked rates, which reset in 31 May, are very, very chunky. You can get a 10 year. Uh, inflation linked at 5.25. What that means is that your uh, capital amount goes up by inflation, and then you get paid five and a quarter percent. And every six months, capital goes up by inflation, and you get paid five and a quarter percent. Unfortunately, you're taxed on the capital increase, and you're taxed on the payment. But that is a chunky yield, particularly if you're worried about inflation. So some burning questions, we'll run through these. Can I open for my kids? Yes, you can. Stockbrokers can't open for under six, but a financial services provider can. The Guardian has to do the FICA. They don't need a bank account. They don't need a SARS number. 
but when they want to draw the money, it has to go into a bank account in their name. Is it worth starting if I'm old? Sure. Yeah, every budget, we had one just last week, the finance minister gets up on the podium and takes money out of our pockets one way or another with taxes. They're giving it back to you here. So if you've got some cash, stick it in. If you're old, you might not have the 65 years. Yeah, maybe you've only got 55. Maybe you've only got 15. Still 15 years of tax-free growth. It's better than 15 years of taxed growth. Can I change the ETFs I hold? As often as you want. Absolutely as often as you want. New ETFs come out and you're like, oh, look at that shiny ETF. So now you want to hold that one. You sell some of that, you buy that. Not a problem. Can I have more than one tax-free account? Yes, but. You can have as many as you want, but the limit 36,000 is to you, the individual, not per account. So if you go open 10 accounts, you can't put 36,000 in each account. You can put 3,600 in each account or 30 in one and 600 in the other, whatever you want. You can have multiple tax-free accounts, but your limit of 36,000 a year and 500,000 lifetime remains in place regardless how many you hold. Will the limits increase? We've had two increases on the annual limits. I think we will see an increase, but we didn't get one this year, maybe in the next year or so. Sure. Uh, the annual limit, I, I, I want to say yes, but I simply don't know. So firstly, the annual limit, we only start bumping into it in about five years' time. So at that point, the folks who'd be maxing out get to their 500,000, and now they're like, hey, come on, guys. Like, I, I want to, you know. Does Treasury add to it? The problem is, is they're losing money, right? Because at the end, we don't pay tax on it. And they're going to make the argument, you know what, 500,000 for the average South African is a big number. They're not wrong about that. So the annual limits, yes. The lifetime limit, maybe. Tax-free or RA or Reg 28? Both. Max out your tax-free, max out your Reg 28. Reg 28 is 350,000 a year or 27.5%, whichever is smaller that you can then deduct. If you overpay in a Reg 28, you don't get penalized, you just don't get the benefit, but you can roll that benefit into future years. So while you're high earning, you could overpay, and then when you're not high, high earning and you're in retirement, you can claim those tax credits back. My argument is, max out both. SARS is giving you money back. Key difference, your Reg 28 is pre-tax money, your tax-free is post-tax money. Holding cash, Touched on that, if you're 104, yes. Otherwise, mm, not sure. If you need, if, if you've got cash and you need to offset some of that interest liability, sure. Crypto, there are, I mean, we don't even, no. You cannot put crypto in a tax-free account. Can't do it, not possible. Uh, will never be possible, quite truthfully, won't happen. Even if we one day get a crypto ETF in South Africa, I think we will probably within the next year or so. It's not going to be allowed in your tax-free account. So short answer, we should all have one. We should ignore the short-term market, market, market gyrations. This is a long-term investment product. Keep it simple, watch costs, fill up tax-free and Reg 28. And you can get clever. The money you save on the Reg 28 from tax, you can put that into your tax-free. Another idea in Arena Fissa had is you're sitting with 36,000 rand of ETS, but you don't have the 36,000 cash tomorrow to put in. Well, sell the 36,000 ETFs. You'll have some capital gain, but remember the first 40,000 is, is not counted. So you're not within the exclusion. Sell your 36,000 of ETFs, put it into your tax-free account and take the 3,000 rand a month that you were going to put into your tax-free account and rebuild those ETFs. So in a year's time, you've got 36,000 of ETFs, sell them, put them in. Why? Because you get those payments up front. It is better if you can do it lump sum on day one. I appreciate we can't all. So let's see what questions are. I am done. Uh, contact details, disclaimers, as always. Uh, let's see what sort of questions. Tax implications and ETFs that don't pay dividends and reinvest directly. Uh, so it gets quite messy, and it's why we now have to, all ETFs in South Africa are paying dividends unless they are a feeder. In other words, they're taking an offshore ETF and plugging it straight in, and that offshore ETF doesn't pay dividends, you pay some dividend tax there, but that's now moot. And that moot is quite simply because all ETFs in South Africa are now distributing. Pam, does, why do Signa ETFs pay dividends then take the ETF fee immediately afterwards? Quite a big percentage cancels out the dividend. I hear what you're saying. So 
Signia pays a dividend uh, from the ETF and it says, you've received a one rand dividend. And you're all excited. And then they're like, dum, dum, dum. And we're taking 40 cents. And you're like, whoa, hang on. Signia's taking 40% of my dividend. Yes, they're taking 40% of your dividend. But that 40% of your dividend, let's say it's a 2% dividend, what does that equate to as a percentage of the ETF? 0.8%. That's where they take their annual fee. The difference is, no one else discloses it like Signia. Everyone else takes it. No one else discloses it like Signia. Uh, if you want a more detailed example, just one lab.com, search Signia dividends. I've gone into the big detail. It's just that they show it different and it looks, I appreciate, quite alarming, but actually you're not being ripped off. Why are ETFs cheaper than unit trusts? A bunch of reasons. And it's a great question from uh, Anon. Uh, firstly, unit trusts are usually active which means they're buying and selling, which means they need tons of smart people with fancy degrees to do those decision-making processes. That costs money. And then secondly, the way that ETS are, con are constructed is cheaper than the way unit trusts are constructed. Again, I'm not going to go into the details to get to technical. Again, there is a power, a power hour uh, by Nirina Fisser, of course, who else, uh, where she goes into this, um, but they are cheaper. And it's mostly the active passive debate and then just how the construct of the ETFs versus the unit trust is made. Uh, Tandere, uh, information on viability of easy equities given earlier as suspended. Yeah, no, so they bought the Cloud Atlas ones uh, and they want to turn them into active. And while that process is happening, those ETFs got suspended. They will come back. Easy equities is fine. And understand, if you're worried about easy equities or any stockbroker or FSP, there are protections in place. You've got insurance. So let's take easy equities. Your shares are not held by Easy Equities. They're held in a third party called World Trader. They are physically there. Easy Equities doesn't have access to those shares. It, it's not their capital or their assets or anything like that. Easy Equities goes bust. Those shares are still there. JSC has got about a 2 billion rand fund for in case of crookery. So it's not the, 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 the brokers going bust that we need to worry about. It's the companies going bust that, that we are investing into. Uh, Ray, which TFSAs can be actively managed? Signia offers this option. Any tax-free. Uh, does Momentum, I don't know about the Momentum product. Uh, Rand Swiss, most certainly, I would imagine. Most of them can be actively managed, unless you're in like a cash product, in which case there's not much managing to do. Um, but the ones that I've all seen are actively manageable, nice and easy. Uh, certain, oh, sorry, Pierre, you're actually correct. Certain of the AM ETFs are actually in the tax, are allowed in the tax free. So my broker and other brokers, when you go, they, they literally give you a list and say, these ones are cool or not. Uh, Desiree, where do you find the info which shows whether you can sell an ETF, the money deposited into the tax free account, they pay everything back into your bank account. Hmm. I am not sure what's happening here at all. So Desiree, you're saying that when you sell an ETF, it goes into your bank account, not your tax-free account. So in a tax-free account, that should absolutely not be happening. I would take that up with, with Signia. There might be a misalignment. In other words, you've ticked a box or maybe they've ticked a box or something. But ch uh, check with that because certainly... I've never heard of that happening before. That is not good at all. Clive, uh, can you do an X fee transfer from a bank a savings account to an ETF? Yes, you can. But you'd have to open a, a, a ETF enabled tax free account and then do the transfer across. Um, and it can be across banks, but absolutely you can. If you're sitting with a traditional savings account cash in it, you don't want it anymore, open the new one, tell them you want to do the transfer and let them do it. Don't draw the money and transfer it because that will hit your limits. Anonymous, certain, uh, yes, I, I appreciate, yeah. So the PM, that's the one I was thinking of, the PMX, etc. So yeah, some of the income ones are there, my bad. Uh, can miners open a TFA and not register for tax? John, yes, they can, but they've got to do it with an FSP, not a stockbroker. It's a small nuance, but if you're trying to open one and your broker says can't do it, well, then go to a, 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 an FSP, which is what most of them are. Can you add 36 into the same tax free every year or must you add into a different? Sarah, great question. Same one. You got one account, stick it into there every time. You could have extra, but there's no need for that. Uh, does it matter when the tax you are deposit the 36? No. Nah. Um, so look, first of March is best, but you put it in December 
that's perfectly fine. Absolutely doesn't matter. You've got from the 1st of March to the 28th or 29th of February. Anonymous, why do some ETFs have better bid offer? Oh, ooh, brilliant question. So there's buys and sells in the market. And I was talking earlier around fair values. And what they do is they, I'm going to run my time, folks. We are recording. If you've got to leave, the video will be on just one lap later this evening. But I will go through all the questions. I've got another half dozen or so still to go. Um, so you've got the market maker who's buying and selling in the market. And some ETF providers slash market makers just make it wider. So, for example, go look at the... S&P 500, there's four of them, and there'll be different percentages in terms of what that spread, as we call it, is. Difference between buy and sell. Now, that's a cost to you. It's a one-off cost up front, but it is technically a cost to you. So it is an important one to have. And it's just, it's a decision made by the ETF issuer. Is the lifetime limit based on our contributions or the growth? It is contributions only. Growth is not important. So you've got 500,000 contribution for your life, 36,000 per year. Uh, good tips, Marinda. My absolute pleasure. Luzana, uh, joined a bit late, stuck in traffic recording. I'm going to say tomorrow morning, hopefully tonight, but there's a lot to get through. But definitely by tomorrow morning, it will be up. You'll find it at just one lap. Uh, is it cheaper to take up a huge amount, convert it to dollars, and invest in interactive brokers? Or is Easy Equities fine when it comes to a long-term investment platform? Easy Equities is fine for offshore. Caveats, check what the fees are. I don't know. Um, and caveats, they don't have everything available in New York, whereas Interactive does. So uh, beyond those two caveats, uh, Easy is, is, is quite fine. Uh, can a child accountant different, have different his or own limit? Yes. So your child has a tax-free account, they have a 36,000 rand limit, you have a 36,000 rand limit. you got 10 kids, that's 360,000 a year, and then yourself. So the kids' limit is different to your limit. Do you get an RA on tax-free account? Hmm. No. No. Uh, <laughs> because, uh, I mean, as, I, as you typed that, there was someone's head and SARS exploded. Nope, afraid not. That's too much tax saving for them. Uh, appreciate the feedback. Does transferring affect the 500,000 limit? No, it does not. And that's why you have to transfer. So it's very important that you transfer. And you, if you draw the money out and deposit it into a new provider, yes, that deposit will affect the limits. If you transfer from one provider to another, it does not affect the limits. That is hugely important. Transfers do not affect the limits. Ladies and gents, I've run my time by a few minutes. I've done all of the questions, so we are rocking and rolling. Uh, video will be up later this afternoon. Uh, Pam, yeah, Pam, if, you, if you're running, oh, okay, that question, if you, drop me a mail, I can send you the link if you want as well. And I think it was Desiree who was struggling with paying into your account. You're welcome to mail me. Uh, is my email address there? Uh, no, it's not. My email is simon at justonelap.com. You will find it there. Yo, folks from Bangkok, Tesco, I really appreciate that. Um, we're back in April. It will be in person at Baker Street. And I'm going to encourage everyone, come to Baker Street. It's in Rosebank. It's fun. There's a car train. There's stuff happening. Next, impress the heck out of, out of Standard Bank. We'll carry on. We'll start again third Thursday of April, run to the end of the year. I appreciate their support. Most of all, I appreciate we had a sellout audience this evening. This is the largest webcast we've done since the darkest days of, of pandemic. I appreciate each and every one of you coming through this evening. I appreciate the questions. Everyone, stay safe. Look after yourself. And as always, if you can, look after somebody else as well.